Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce Mitchell Silber, the Executive Director of the Community Security Initiative. Mitch? Great. Thanks so much, Seth. I'm glad so many of you are able to participate in this week's Consultants Corner. And this week, we're going to be talking about training. What type of training should you get done? How should you set that up? Working with DHES and others to make that happen. And uh, Dove and Ilya will be leading us through that process. I also want to note that after this week, we're going to take a pause in our consultants' corners for the time being. Our team's very busy with getting assessments done and, and trainings. And we want to give you all some time to absorb everything that we've been able to put out in the last few weeks. But obviously, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to your regional security manager. We're still glad and you know, want to be able to help you as you go through the process, grant-wise or procurement-wise, and are here to help. So with that, let me turn things over to Dove and Ilya. Gotcha. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you for the update. Everybody, you know, the whole team will still be available. Obviously, continue reaching out with your questions. Real quick, before we jump into today's session on developing a training program, just a quick checklist and refresher, right? We always got to make sure that everyone involved, everyone participating recognizes when you have that official question, first of all, always make sure you contact your DHSES rep and you get official answers from them. Obviously, us and the whole team will always be there to help guide you and navigate some of the gray areas. But when it's time, when you need that direct answer, make sure you talk to your rep. Feel free to take a picture of this, this page. Obviously, it's the end of March, so your first quarterly reports will be due at the end, by the end of April. You know, just say the activity you've done. Maybe you've placed ads. Maybe you've started moving the process even further. Maybe worked with your RSM, been on these webinars. So any activity, the, the reps want to see that you have moved forward and you have taken that activity, showing that you're making this effort with the grant. The number one thing they don't want to see is waiting to the last minute. It's two, three years into your grant period and nothing's been happening. So definitely, you know, your quarterly reports will be done soon. You should have that binder also that has all your materials. The reps will tell you they like the binders themselves. It's not a requirement, but it will definitely help you both from a project management piece and with your requirements here. All right, so the other pieces we've talked about each week, I'm not gonna go through each, but just importantly, as you move forward and get to the advertisement stage, being that we, our team, CSI, cannot refer vendors, uh, what we can do is help if you, once you're at the advertisement stage, the actual posted in the newspaper, share that with your RSM, share it with us, and we'll help distribute it a little further. Today's topic is developing a training program. Obviously, everyone has been very mindful of training and the importance and, and that piece of the puzzle of your security game. We want to make sure you have all the tools to think about how to develop it right. And we will start today with Bill Hayes, the Westchester and Bronx RSM, to talk about some of the CSI trainings and lessons learned. And with that, I will turn to Bill. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. And, and thank you for your participation and all the feedback, because your feedback helps us get better at what, we, at what we do. And that includes when we're developing training programs. It's really a good thing to see that most of the community recognizes that Training is part of the bigger security package, right? From you know hardware to policy to training, there is recognition in the community that training is important, and we get a lot of inquiries as to you know can we deliver training? Or you know I know a lot of organizations are looking at vendors and they have grant funding that they put in for training, so that's a good thing. But one thing we've observed over the last couple of years in terms of developing a training program is anything you do, any new program, any project you do, you really have to front load that with your objectives. You have to know at the beginning what you want it to look like at the end. And sometimes that gets missed along the way. If we get a training request, hey, we need you to come do some training. Usually our first response is going to be great. No problem. What do you want to know? And then, you know, it's kind of like dead air. And a lot of times it's not known. We know we need training. We know we need to increase our security profile, but we don't exactly know what we want to know. And that's that's a really important conversation to have along with the regional security manager, but also internally, because your training objectives are going to vary depending on the type of organization you are. If you're a synagogue, you may have certain objectives. The school's objectives are going to be different. JCCs, an office or an agency is going to have a different outcome in mind, and it has to be identified up front. Otherwise, you're kind of just... You're driving blindly through a snowstorm without knowing what you want to accomplish at the end. Part of that means identifying your intended audience. Is it staff? Is it, and even within the category of staff, we're talking about full-time staff, part-time seasonal staff, if there's a camp maybe in your organization, or are we trying to inform the lay leadership, maybe security committee folks, 
or as a congregants or members at large, depending on the organization. So, so those things are important to identify on the front end when you're trying to develop a training program. In terms of program development, a lot of us here at CSI have a background in training. We pretty much, uh, the regional security managers, managers have all come out of law enforcement. And at some point or another, we've lived in the training world. When you're developing a training program, we always want to make sure that the things we're telling people to do comports with best practice, right? Your training vendor or even us, we're always trying to pay attention to what's considered best practice in the industry. In this case, we're talking about security and counterterrorism or crime prevention. The trainers need to be informed and you need to make sure that your trainer, whoever it happens to be, is staying on top of best practice. And that means best practice here in the United States based on evidence, based on research, based on what's currently accepted practice here. Well, I think later on, Ilya might be talking about delivery methods, but there's different things you can accomplish with different delivery methods, whether it's virtual or live. And technology has been great. It affords us to reach a whole lot of people. But if we're talking, again, identifying what you want to do, if we're talking about knowledge-based training, virtual training can be appropriate for that. But if we're talking about a skills-based type training, like Stop the Bleed, where it's really beneficial for you to be hands-on, then maybe live training is a better format for that. Some things we've learned along the way, scheduling for the organization, once they go, yes, we want to have training, sign me up. And then scheduling becomes an issue because particularly if it's a day and night, seven day a week operation, sometimes you have administrative staff in during the day, religious school staff only comes at night or on Sundays and scheduling has become an issue for some organizations. So these are just really talking points and food for thought as you move forward in developing a training program. And also we advocate at CSI, and I kind of dig in on this one personally, security really has to be a whole of community effort. It can't just be the facilities person. It can't just be the executive director. It can't just be the security guards or the security contractors. It really has to be whole of community. And that includes clergy. In a house of worship, if something happens during a service, for instance, clergy member, cantor or rabbi, in the first few seconds of an emergency has some pivotal opportunities and responsibilities to inform the congregation. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to be in charge of resolving the whole incident. You know, at some point, someone else is going to take over, but those conversations need to be had. Everybody has to know where all the other moving parts of an emergency interact. And that could be a terrorist attack, or we could be talking about a fire or a tornado. All those moving parts have to come together. So a proposal or an idea that kind of carves out the different elements of an organization is probably not a good thing because then you're creating silos of information and we don't want that to happen. We want to integrate everybody in the organization into whatever training you're doing. So everybody knows what everybody else's responsibility is. And optimally, you want to reach to the outside stakeholders and bring in police, fire, whoever is appropriate for whatever that matter is. And uh, one thing I left out under objectives is identify exactly the subject matter that you want to hear. And if it's something that's not in our current repertoire, we can and will develop it. And we've done that, you know, sometimes on the fly. About a year ago, there were some concerns about how to spot suspicious activity in one particular organization, and we were able to put a presentation together. So there are existing programs that we run, and we're certainly not opposed to developing or customizing a program for your particular needs. So, Dove, any questions? No, that was great. Well said. Definitely stick around for the end when we do Q&A, so you'll be available too. Absolutely. Um, but it, it's been an amazing program, what CSI has been putting out there for the community. But again, a piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Bill. All right. Appreciate it. Let's continue on and get into the development stages. Before we do that, let's recognize, right, we started these sessions talking about the grant rules and procurement requirements. There's always a little bit of confusion around what the state requires if you're using grant funds for your training, right? So whether you're still doing this, whether you originally budgeted for it, let's just take a, a couple minutes to understand. This is one of the forms what we're seeing on, on the side of your screen is one of the forms from DHSES, from the state. This one is an example from their hate crimes grant, but the same thing will, similar type of form will apply to your federal grant that you need to submit before you can sign off on who your training vendor, your cons training consultant will be. Just like when you install cameras or hardened doors, DHSCS is not approving the vendor. They're not even approving the exact, you know, the specs and installation. They're making sure obviously complies with DHP, but they're making sure more importantly, it does what you were awarded for, what you requested in your application. So if your application, you're acting for, you ask for active shooter situ situational awareness, but you submit a training project for first aid, not that there's anything inherently wrong with first aid, 
That's not what you're budgeted for. So they're obviously going to give a little pushback and make sure it lines up with what you submitted in your IJ, your hate crimes application. Um, you know, obviously not, you know, it's going to match up with your assessment, with your application, with what you put together. So make sure when you do find your vendor and you select what you want to go forward with, it is in line with what you're awarded. All right. So when you're at that stage, what you need to do is ask your rep for the training form. This is an example of the hate crimes form, maybe a, a little bit old as well, but get the latest form. Obviously, they'll advise you and coach you along so you can so we can ensure that you're following the process, most importantly, to get reimbursed and ensure a good program. But let's cover a few important pieces, just like everything else in your projects. The procurement rules require you to have three bids, right? You still need to find three training companies that, you know, can comply with the rules, can do a good training, the projects you want. You need to get those three bids and evaluate them in the scoring matrix, just like everything else. Like we just mentioned, DHS must approve the training prior. Again, they have no idea who the vendors are. They have no idea who the companies are. That's not what they're getting into. They're making sure it aligns with what you were awarded, what you were budgeted for. And again, that'll be a limited category of items, but they wanna make sure it matches up. Obtain that latest form. And what a lot of people struggle with, the state also wants a curriculum. The curriculum is basically the agenda of the day that your training tra trainer will do for you. They wanna make sure it is in line. It can't just be, Dove security company providing this situational awareness. What does that include? What does it talk about? What's the day going by? So they want to see that when you get, when you get, you go to three bids, you select, Hey, this company, we want to go forward with you. We're going to need a more formal curriculum before we can go into contract with you because we need to get approval from DHSES. You should tell this to your vendors, right? We need to get this approval. So don't sign anything yet. Don't move forward yet. Don't commit to anything yet, but you'll need to take their bid, ask for a, a detailed curriculum that you will present along with this form to your representative and they'll get back to you. You know, they want you to move forward. A lot of people are concerned. Sometimes they're being held up. They're never being held up. This money is for you. They want you to spend it, but they want to make sure in line with your grant and appropriately. The other thing they always ask for after the sessions is a roster of attendees. Right? There's numerous, numerous people in your organization, different groups. They want to make sure that there was an effective training. This money that was awarded to you is going to a good representation of your organization, not just two people who sat in a room and got the training. They want to see that the money was spent efficiently and effectively. All right. So again, reach out to your RSMs for more guidance. Reach out to your reps, of course, uh, the goal being an effective program and that you get reimbursed appropriately. So just make sure you take the steps before committing signing any contracts. So you guys are, are, are used to me already by this point, the puzzle, right? Security in itself is a piece of your security puzzle, right? Bill mentioned how it fits together, right? With your policies, with your hardware. And, and that's the reality. It is a piece and we're all seeing uh, based on recent events, how important it is. But we need to think about a lot of things and some that Bill had mentioned already, right? So you need to get together before you get to that stage and just ask vendors to tell you what you want. You need to think about what you want. Who is getting this training, right? Is it all membership, ushers, security volunteers, right? Depending on who's getting it, A, will kind of change the delivery style, maybe some of the material, maybe some of the content. Maybe you have different buckets within your organization. It can be tailored a little bit to each, but you need to think who is getting it. All staff, volunteers, it makes a difference. Think about this on the front end. So you can then make, therefore make a better request of your trainer. The topic, right? Bill was talking about a couple examples. Obviously, for the grant purposes, it has to be in line with your budgeted project. But brought more broadly, there's a lot of security and emergency related topics out there. What, what does your organization need? Think, think about how it can be best applied. Where are you lacking? Or at least a starting point. You can always develop and continue. Training is not a one and done process. On that note, how often? How often should this training happen? It is definitely not sufficient to have one training. We're trained. Things change. New employees, the environment, culture, your security procedures. So many things can change that you need to ensure you continue this on a, a regular process, quarterly. For example, right? you have to decide what's right for your organization. New developments in the environment, you might need to do it more often. Definitely at onboarding, right? When new employees come, are they trained in your security policies and practices at a minimum, let alone 
some of the bigger topics we're talking about, active threat, situational awareness, you know, those are things everyone in your organization should have, but there's obviously some topics just that onboarding you want to make sure people have, and you have a good approach to share that information and distribute it. Speaking of approach, everyone has different learning styles, you know, but we have to think what will reach the most people in our organization effectively, deliver the message, and ensure it resonates. So you have to think about this group of people sitting around the table designing and thinking about what you want. How are we going to have it delivered? Is it classroom? Is it the training? Is it a drill? Right? There's different styles in that way alone. So again, another piece of the puzzle to think about as you develop your training. And updates and refreshers, you know, similar to thinking about how often you want to do it. You need that to be part of your plan. Are you bringing in the same security trainer to do it? Will you be being out, able to do it in-house? Maybe, you know, not always a piece of the training, but sometimes you want to give an update in other ways internally to ensure that everyone's on the same page and everyone has the information they need. So ensuring that, you know, you can share this information and everyone is up to date, knows the policies, knows the plans, knows what they're expected to do. That's kind of the most important. So we can have confidence to do everything else the organization is, is obligated to, is what our focus of operations are. Because ideally, we can keep on working smoothly on everything else we have to do, but we know we're confident that if something were to happen, we, our staff, our constituents know what to do. And finally, vendor expectations. I think Bill was touching on this a little bit as well. You know, when you, now we've designed it, we went through a couple of the considerations and, and Ilya will go further and deeper, but as you go through these things about what you're thinking about, now what do we expect from the vendor? How long should the session be? Where, what time? These things sound nuanced, but it's important. You know, what? how many sessions? You know, if you have budget category in your grants for a certain amount of money, how many sessions will that realistically deliver for you? And you should be able to dis decide that with your vendor or with your team, how many are really expected. This should be set up on the front end. So you wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page as you go into it. And it's not just the vendor dictating, maybe taking advantage, maybe trying to figure out the best way they can do it on their terms. Especially when you have budget for this, you know, make sure you're getting all the groups that you have identified that need training, ensuring that they are, they're all getting a session multiple sessions perhaps. Some people might not be able to go during the day, but you can come after work. So that means you at least need two right there, right? That's something we have to think about. You know, some people, you can't take everyone on break at the same time, right? If you're a smooth running operation, everyone's always doing something. So you have to think about how many sessions will realistically be able to, to distribute the message to your constituents, to your group. So just remember that puzzle as you move forward with your training development. And with that, I will turn it over to Ilya. Thank you. Thanks, Dov. I uh, appreciate it. Um, and also, Bill, thank you so much for um, starting us up on this. Uh, Seth, can you please move on to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, I want you all to just take a moment uh, while I collect my thoughts uh, to just read this. Um, and so um, this comes up quite often um, in organizations. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of training when designed, delivered, um, unfortunately falls short of not only the expectations in organizations, but also, unfortunately, it doesn't resonate as well as it should. It doesn't maximize uh, the change in behavior uh, or the expected um, adjustments uh, in the organization. Uh, even though it's fair to say that in the in like in the last decade, training has been um, a focus in organizations. It remains to be so today, regardless of whether those organizations are nonprofit or um, commercial, you know, private sector or even government organizations. Needless to say, we've all been through some sort of training in our lifetime, right? Multiple sessions, probably, uh, and so you could probably look back and remember some of the examples that are uh, stated here in this message. Uh, let's jump to the next slide, Seth. I do not want you to train this way. I repeat myself. I wish that you do not 
attend a training session that has this feel and vibe when it's delivered to you. And then you walk out of that training session and you feel like you've received training and everybody said taps, you know, pats themselves on the shoulder and they pay the vendor and you've completed the training session, put a tick box that you've completed it. Right. And at the end of the day, it was a major waste of money and everybody's time. So I don't want you to be uh, in the situation. So I'll walk you through a few things that um, I, over the years, and the team at uh, CSI over the years have been observing. Uh, and we've been building some awareness about what training works. And Bill actually started us uh, uh, off on this. And uh, Dov also continued a few things that, that need to be considered. Uh, Seth, let's move on to the next slide for a moment. Thank you. Dov said a very important word, nuance. Nuances, like nothing else, matter in training that you wish to receive. Only training that's well-designed and well-delivered is worth its money or worth your time. If it's training that at the end of the day does not maximize behavior change, does not... Um, achieve desired results, okay? Um, only that, if that training is delivered without those major attributes, unfortunately, um, you know, for organizations, it's just a waste of money. And uh, most importantly, everybody's time. Time from the vendor that's delivering it. And also time from the community that's receiving it. So let's move on to the next slide, Seth. Um, Bill touched on a very important subject here. Training does have different delivery methods. Um, I've taken the liberty of looking at um, my past experience and also some of the literature that I've been uh, reading up on um, effective training methods because multiple organizations, FEMA, NASA, various agencies in, U in US government put put in tremendous amounts of money to um, uh, apply scientific research on effective training and what means and methods are out there to be able to maximize behavior change and uh, also retention of content. Now, we all are familiar pretty much with everything here. Like I'm not gonna tell you something that's very new, right? But you should be aware, like Bill and Dov were saying, that each type of training is fit for purpose in different settings and for different communities and for different reasons, okay? So where you need hands-on training, you don't need to think about web-based training, right? And vice versa. In some cases, if you want to train at scale, and let's say it's just, you know, sharing information, um, just uh, doing general awareness stuff, maybe web-based training is one of the ways to go if you have a large community, right? And you want to be mindful of everybody's time, right? And you maybe want to offer people uh, some ways of uh, doing uh, this training on their own time, at their own pace, right? <clears throat> I have found that probably the two most useful training methods uh, are interactive, where at the very minimum, you're able to ask questions. Why do you think the way we've designed even these sessions, uh, it has polls and also it has a QA. and a uh, and we take deliberately take extra time out of our uh, webinars to actually have this back and forth with you because the next person who asks the question, and thank you to everyone who's been asking them, right? The next person, that's a learning experience for everybody because that opens up uh, the opportunity and the platform for different perspectives, right? And at the end of the day, that also makes the training feel a little bit more community oriented rather than uh, it's the authority, like in the lecture style, style training that is telling you the recipient of, of content, what to do, okay? So the interaction 
builds awareness and builds retention of content. Okay, so it's 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 more useful than just a lecture style style training. Experiential training um, is um, so again something to what you know, Bill alluded to. Uh, it's the training where you're actually doing things hands on. You know, um, where someone is coaching you almost like a group of people on how to do different things, and you are the participant, not just raising your hand, but also um, doing things. Uh, even if it's just uh, standing up and moving around uh, in groups and uh, accomplishing certain tasks during the training, that experience, if well designed, uh, again, builds uh, someone's awareness, content retention, and ability to change their behavior um, after this training, even if it's delivered one time. Uh, Seth, let's jump to the next, uh, the next slide, please. Okay, uh, and again, training can have different designs. Okay, the most simple one is what I'm doing right now. I'm using words, okay, and I'm speaking to you, and hopefully I'm speaking uh, clearly at the right pace, and I'm trying to share with you some information that I've come across both in my experience and also through research. But also, as you will see, we're using PowerPoint and slides as tools to be able to maximize and uh, give you some visuals so that your uh, ability to process information, and uh, we are um, processing information uh, you know, very well when it's delivered to us visually, when it's simplified and visual, right? So it's easier to, uh, to combine words and tools. Uh, we also can design training that makes use of space. Okay, um, some uh, groups of people, for example, deliberately um, clear out large areas in, in spaces in different places, right, where they can do some experiential training, right? And obviously, last but not least, is the type of experience that you as recipients of training should receive. And so I was doing a presentation at one point, and I needed to stress to folks uh, how thinking under duress is different from your normal thinking when you're just going grocery shopping, okay? And I think I mentioned it some time ago, but I just it's worth repeating here, where I used the stage that had a very deep void under it because it was a raised stage, and it resonated. I, I heard how my heels were making very loud noises even as I was walking on that stage. So at some moment when I needed to stress to folks how a moment of um, uh, when, when everybody gets startled, right? How in that moment, they their attention is completely switched to something else. I just stopped my foot on that stage and it created a very large room filling um, sudden noise, right? And you could see how everybody's body jittered, okay? So in a sense, I tried to create an experience for folks to understand, uh, besides me speaking, besides me showing slides to them, because those are the typical things we turn to. But if I also supplement some experiences, um, uh, that helps build awareness and retain content. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. And like I said, uh, two things stand out in, this in, in, in the way that you want to approach your training programs. One is retention of information and habit building, okay? What's the use of doing a lecture, let's say, um, on whatever subject that may be, right? If you walk out, two weeks go by, and if you're presented with the same content, you're like, oh, I may have seen something like this, but I don't really remember what was said. What's the use of that? Right. The other thing is, uh, if, let's say, an unfortunate incident happens and none of the behaviors that were expected after such training occur, right? Like if you weren't able to execute um, during a, an emergency situation what, what you were trained to do, right? Then you haven't built that muscle memory, if you will, uh, to be able to execute that. I'll give you another example. I was, sit, I was uh, delivering training to high net worth executives uh, on uh, matters of executive protection. 
Okay, obviously a topic that's not clearly related to what we're discussing. However, there was a gentleman that turned to me and said, well, how do I fight with an attacker? Okay, and I turned to him, I said, sir, what kind of health are you in? And so he paused and was like, what do you mean? I said, well, how healthy are you? Okay, I said, my mom has diabetes, for example, or, or like somebody uh, has, is short of breath, or their mobility is affected, or they have some other way in which they're physically, you know, um, inferior to someone, uh, to an attacker. Okay, so if, you, if all you could think about is fighting someone, right, um, maybe um, that's, that's not the way to approach this. Maybe you should think about how do you avoid such incidents in the first place, right? So there are all sorts of ways in which um, training can be delivered where both interaction is used, experiences are used, but the ultimate expectation is that people are remembering as much as possible and that they're building habits which they can then use as muscle memory if incidents occur. The other thing about training is that and again, this is not Ilya Umansky's um, um, kind of uh, research, okay? This is what I pick up from multiple pieces of literature that I, that I read uh, on the subject, okay? The, the other thing about training is repetition. If it's not repeated frequently, okay? Um, unfortunately, the retention level is lower, if not very minimal, uh, and habit building is not optimal. Okay, so consider repetition of training. And that's something that Dove mentioned earlier. Uh, do you need refreshers? Um, are there any key points to just kind of uh, maybe review in house or maybe ask the training organization that delivered training to you before, come back, right? And then maybe give you a, a, a I don't know, a shortened version of that training, whatever that may be. But uh, I think those, these two major parts should be part of your evaluation of what are, what are you doing and what kind of training do you ask for and how do you interact with vendors and what do you request them to do? Okay, now let's move to the next slide set. Um, to be quick here, because I do wanna show you a couple of examples, hopefully they'll work. Um, these are the general rules that we would suggest for you to consider as you, um, develop your uh, expectations for training, work on your teams, and decide uh, what, what you want to do. Uh, as I said, interactive and experiential training, again, hopefully it's a good fit for purpose for what you're trying to accomplish, but those two stand out as being more useful than just a lecture style training. I'll just leave it there. Um, it's always good to have someone inside your organization that's been trained as a trainer. Okay, um, now, of course, it really depends on what, what kind of training you're getting. Maybe that person needs to undergo additional hours of training. Maybe they need to be certified in something. Understandable, okay? But having a person who can then pick up the torch in certain situations for certain types of training content and then train in-house in is a useful thing. Um, one item that stands out in a lot of literature about training is that taking notes uh, is a critical part, critical component of someone helping themselves retain as much content as they can. This is why um, even in college settings uh, and in settings that are more familiar to your uh, facilities, if participants, no matter whether it's an interactive and experiential training, have an ability to take notes, it's uh, more likely that the uh, content that you're being presented with is going to stay with you, uh, as, you know, to, to a higher degree than uh, if you weren't taking notes. Um, and this is the next point is where organization actually falls short, in my opinion. So training is performed, you've paid the money, the training company or whatever provider you ask to deliver the training to you uh, leaves. And there is no feedback that you're asking the people who have uh, gone through this training um, uh, to provide. 
regarding how well this training worked, what probably needs to be improved, and maybe some things that uh, attendees were expecting but didn't hear during that training. Maybe they didn't learn certain things, right? So feedback after training is crucial, right? So it should be, in my opinion, built into your um, expectations when you're dealing with vendors and when they're promising to you to deliver a certain scope of services. Uh, now, repetition, as I said, is useful. Uh, here, a recommendation is that uh, quarterly repetition of content is very important. Uh, if you could do it more frequently, fine. If you do it less frequently than uh, on a quarterly basis, you run the risk of unfortunately losing a lot of um, uh, awareness and memory of the training content. Um, and like I said, this is where organizations uh, fall short. So you received that training. Your expectation is that, okay, you got trained. So there, therefore, you probably need to be able to execute when uh, an unfortunate incident happens. But there is no testing of those capabilities. There is no habit building. You're not checking whether people who underwent training, um, whether they're able to uh, perform in certain situations. Now, of course, it doesn't apply to everyone. I completely understand that uh, in some situations you're, um, you know, you're training a wider community, so you can't train, you can't expect that you're going to be testing how they, how well they perform. However, um, at the very minimum, the uh, personnel at the facility. Um, there should be an expectation that, you know, there are some periodic checks of their ability after they've been trained. Okay, so hopefully that training has met expectations and they, then they can perform at a, at a certain expected level. So all of these things you should be discussing with vendors. I'm not saying definitely like copy and paste this into your RFPs, but at least walk through these points with a prospective vendor that you're asking to support you um, and let them give you some feedback on what works, what's their experience, uh, so that you can at least maximize and optimize your chances of receiving quality training. Um, let's see if there's uh, one more slide. I think we were gonna jump to a couple of examples. So at the risk of running at the maximum capacity of our technology, we will try to show you a video. Okay. Now, does anybody remember the procedures that we covered? Um, I think we covered ILS, and I think we covered VOR. Um, I guess that means we have MDB left. Um, oh, and we probably ought to cover VR. Um, do any of you know if that's right? Um, should we continue with MDB approaches, or Bob? Uh, do you remember what we've covered? Actually, it's Rick. We're not sure we've covered ILS, DOR, and MDB. But Professor, you were extremely vague and mentioned that you would come back to each approach and discuss them more. Did I say that? I could explain what we covered that in depth, but well, maybe that was another class. Who knows? So, uh, okay, um, I guess I guess we will get started on radar testers. So um, this is what we don't want you to experience. Okay, this is an example of how training can be very poorly delivered, where a person really does not bring value to the team of people that are expecting to learn something. Um, here's another example that where you'll see um, immediately what the difference is. If you have been impacted by suicide, and others have misunderstood your sexual orientation or expression, if you have been impacted by poverty, You know, some of these things that we're asked are like really intimate and vulnerable parts of us. And so when we start like digging into those things. Okay. So um, 
one of the points I'm trying to share with you here and uh, to at least raise your awareness about what the difference is, um, is that um, the first example was a standard, very old archaic lecture style training where um, the learning facilitator, the instructor, right, uh, was scatterbrained, uh, really didn't understand what, where, and how she designed everything or probably was uh, didn't design things as well as she should have um, uh, didn't really appreciate the audience the team that she was training um, and was just being a bit mechanical and literally just going through a bit of a checklist if you will um, in the second example you will see how each person who is involved in the training is a participant where they feel that they their voices are being heard where they feel that they're engaged. Uh, and um, it's less of instruction and more uh, interaction and collaboration uh, and also sharing of experiences, not only through words, but also observing um, behaviors, body language and things like that. Uh, these things do matter. They uh, do maximize uh, people's uh, engagement with training, and also they maximize retention of content, and then the ability to um, execute uh, and perform under stress during um, during various incidents. It builds that muscle memory. Um, that's all I had for you. Um, I think that we have uh, now a little bit of time for Q and A, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks all for uh, for indulging us with, with you know as we share this with you. Back to you, Doug. All right. Thank you, Ilya. Um, before we jump into Q&A, uh, hopefully we, we shared with you some good kind of background build up information for developing your training. Um, for those of you who unfortunately missed the, the start of today's session, um, just to reiterate, Mitch had announced that we're putting a little bit of a pause on our consultants corner for the time being, just a lot of demands on the team on us that we need to be able to uh, respond to and focus on. But obviously these the videos we've done so far are recorded, are available, and the team is still available. So, uh, you know, going forward on Tuesdays, the session won't, won't be uh, live. Uh, the other thing to say is just before we go into the Q&A, which will, Bill will be leading up for us, remember that re repetition. Remember that re this is not a one and done deal. Trainings need to continue, they need to be refreshed, need to be updated. That's why, think about it, uh, in the school districts, right? Kids are doing fire drills repeatedly. I don't, I don't know the rules. Is it once a month? Is it quarterly? Probably based on the school district, but everyone knows throughout the rest of their life what's expected, uh, how to respond to a, a fire bell, a fire bell or, or a real emergency. So just think about that kind of roteness, that comfort, that understanding of what exactly is supposed to be done because it's, it's just been worked into them and drilled into you so much one time we would not be where we are in terms of fire emergency. So similar, similarly, what can be applied to other security demands and needs? So just please don't, you know, think about Colleyville, uh, the rabbi there, how many training sessions he was involved in. And that's kind of what uh, got this latest uh, request and demand for trainings, which we've always been doing. The team's always been a part of. It's been part of the grants, uh, uh, an integral part of any security program. Um, but just remember, it's it's not a one and done deal. You got you got to keep it going. Obviously, update and tweak it, but those refreshers are critical. Um, with that, I'll turn to Bill. Uh, we de definitely got a, a few minutes left and some questions. Thanks, Dove. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, and if you don't mind, I'll pick up the first uh, first one. Uh, what training vendors and resources do you recommend we consider? FEMA, CISA, uh, Secure Community Network, CSS, JCRC really all of the above, all of those organizations are reputable. Each of them have, you know, a catalog of training resources, including CSI. Um, and, and you really shouldn't limit yourself to any single source, right? The more information you get on a topic, the better. And, you know, this dovetails into the last point. Um, when I teach, I kind of, you know, uh, and, and all of us have had some formal instruction on, on training, on how to train the four R's. Repetition reinforces, uh, retention and recall, right? We wanna make sure that we habituate the behaviors, right? We remember something uh, instinctively after enough exposure and, and then you, you, it's not a burden anymore, it becomes habit. So the more sources for information 
uh, uh, that you get, the better. So, and, and with the caveat that it should be reputable. If you're going out to the private sector, make sure that you vet your vendor, um, either through references or, or see, um, you know, what their certifications are. Um, and uh, moving on to the next one, I probably could help with this. And uh, if you guys want to jump in, what basic training package would you, rec would you recommend we consider, i.e. CPR, Stop the Bleed, Active Threat Awareness, uh, Emergency Operations Planning, so I really got to go back to my initial comments. What are your objectives? What kind of organization are you? What is your target audience? What's their knowledge base existing right now? And what is it you're trying to accomplish? In, in, in some cases, you may have to train people just on, on uh, habituating, locking the door. And if you're not at that stage yet, then let's forget about this more of this high level stuff. So you have to know your organization, know what your objectives are, and then you drive forward towards the goal. Um, Otherwise, like I said, I use the phrase, you know, driving, driving blind in a snowstorm. Um, you can train to check the box or you can train to meet an objective and you really should have your objectives laid out in front of you first. Beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll add in if, if you don't yeah, mind. Uh, yep. First of all, well said. Um, and, and that's the reality. Just like any security program we do, any installations, we kind of need to prioritize. We need to base it on our threat on our vulnerabilities, same thing here. I don't think we should just throw a huge menu at everybody because then that, that kind of goes back to our other problems. It's a lot of material to, to retain, to learn, to understand. Uh, where are we lacking? Where have there been some concerns? Uh, where have we learned in the past that we have, we're missing something? Um, you know, Obviously there are some starting points, but it's gonna really depend on your organization's uh, needs and demands at the time. And like Bill said, and I totally agree, start basic, build that foundation. Now, Dolph, just to piggyback on what both of you guys said, I, I want everybody to also look at this as a couple of different buckets. One is, you know, in that question, it was mentioned regarding CISA and CSS. These are all free trainings, and these are organizations that aren't charging for training. So when you look at about using your grant funds from the NSGP to do some training, it would be with one of these organizations. So if you could maximize what you're doing for training under the grant, by utilizing as much as you can these organizations, uh, government agencies, uh, non-governmental organizations like Community Security Initiative to do training for free, then you could use your funds to do some things that maybe are a little more involved that cost some funds, such as like CPR training uh, for certification. You might have to bring in or a certified trainer that you'll have to uh, pay that individual to certify people in CPR and first aid and so on. You might be able to use funds for that. So it's something to explore. And remember, as much as you can get from free from the police department, from the community security initiative, you should use that and, and utilize the resources that are out there. Uh, and we're talking about training, but even if it means, okay, we're well, able to get active assailant training from CSI, let's move that funds we're gonna use from that and ask for an IJ modification and move it into some infrastructure uh, security enhancements and utilize the funds that way because you're getting training covered for free. I'll, really, I'll add one cat. I'm yeah. sorry, Bill. I was going to say really, really good point there. Uh, you know, I, I always tell um, uh, organization leadership to try to use the grant funds for things you could not normally afford, you know, so you can maximize those grant opportunities and then seek out uh, free and or affordable uh, things on, on the outside of the grant. I'll add one caveat. Um, and obviously I'm a, a huge fan of the huge, whole CSI team. You have some of the best trainers in the biz. The flip side of using funds to do trainings is you can definitely demand your vendors how you kind of to work within your schedule to provide the certain amount, how many sessions you want, right? When obviously maximize the organizations that are out there. That's why they're there. Um, you know, I personally was you know part of a government organization before uh, coming back to work with CSI, you know, there's sometimes they're a little bit more handheld, you know, handcuffed on what they can say and deliver and their style. So just recognize everything's got its pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. And there's still an advantage if, if you can af afford a vendor to supplement the trainings that, that these organizations can provide you. Very good. Um, and that's a really good segue to the next question. What type of grants will fund training? Well, NSGP does. And uh, how about hate crimes, guys? You're going to have to help me with that. One. Does hate crimes fund Hate training? crimes does training, but no planning. Um, obviously, your training should match with your plans and policies. But uh, I think that question is from out of state anyways. Um, but NSGP 
does provide, yes, um, provide money. for train for training if you, if you requested it beforehand. Yep. Or an IJ mod. Thank you. And Dov, this one's for you. Uh, I know the answer already. Do you need bids? And this refers to your illustration with the uh, lower cost. Of, do you need bids for uh, this, meaning training, if it's only a few hundred dollars cost? So uh, I think you're, I know your stock answer, but it's worth repeating. <laughs> so yeah, the end, end of the day is there, that it's a good question. Um, there are some lower amounts within the grant awards that you technically don't need to do bids for. I don't want to get into that here. I don't recall what the threshold is, 500, 1,000. Um, that you're right. Technically, you don't need to get three bids. For, to make everyone's life easier on these sessions, we stayed out of the nuances. We basically always advise three bids, sealed bid process. Uh, if, you, if you're not 100% sure, obviously refer back to what the state will always say. Look at your contract and the thresholds uh, or ask your rep. Um, but the flip side is, I don't know what training you're going to get for a couple hundred bucks. So um, there's that side of it. But technically, uh, yeah, I think if, if you are under the threshold and don't quote me on the threshold, please, um, you technically would not need three bids in that scenario. It's a good time to ask your rep. Definitely. Yep. Um, and also remember, this is, again, based on feedback from the audience. NSGP does fund training but remember nsgp is a counter-terrorism grant so it's going to fund counter-terrorism training no it's not going to fund cpr training it's not going to fund stop the bleed kits because it's not the focus of the grant it's a counter-terrorism grant so you have to read the uh, rfp and understand the parameters of the grant when you're when you're applying um, and another member of the audience um, really important i should have said this uh, remember when you're talking about training picture a staircase it's progression uh, Ilya touched on this. Um, you know, you don't start off a training program with a drill, right? A drill is is where you practice skills you already know and and evaluate those skills. So you have to start at the baseline, establish a baseline, a foundation of knowledge, right? And we do this through seminars and workshops, and then we graduate to putting things into practice. I was a volunteer firefighter once, right? Had to go to school, had to go to a classroom training and learn how the hoses and the engines worked. And then we went out and we, we played around with that equipment and connected all the hoses. And then at one point, we, after we had established a baseline of knowledge, we went out and did functional exercises where we actually went to a building that we either lit on fire or a smokehouse and connected real water to real hoses and real fire trucks, right? Same thing with your security training. You're going to lay a foundation. We are in, the, in, in a cycle right now where CSI is going out to institutions and we're, we're talking about active threat, uh, how to respond to an active threat. Um, that's really seminar format or workshop format. We're introducing really new concepts that the community ha has asked to know more about and we're, we're laying a foundation that we can build upon in the future through redundant and repetition, uh, uh, redundancy and repetition and, and someday graduate to the point where, you know, we, we can kind of do these exercises, start off with tabletops, hypotheticals, and then we can graduate to the point where, hey, maybe we're bringing the police in and we're doing real drills in their building with real cops and, and, and taking that foundation and putting it into practice. And, and that's the progression that that training should look like. You don't start off with, uh, with you know, you don't, you don't put a kid who just got his driver's license into a BMW or a Lamborghini, right? You know, you, you got to start them off slow. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is, and I think that's all I have for the moment. Uh, so, uh, okay, good question. What does CSI directly provide in terms of training programs? Um, we uh, have in the past provided uh, active threat training, surveillance, hostile, detecting hostile surveillance and suspicious activity training, stop the bleed training, although uh, that was the uh, uh, the non-skills-based training is a web-based training because we're in the middle of the pandemic. And CSI being relatively new, we continue to grow and expand our uh, training library. And sometimes we work in partnership with other organizations and sometimes we, um, we uh, have our standalone programs, but we're constantly developing new stuff and, um, and we are responsive to the community. Again, if you have something that you wanna know more about, we don't have an existing training program We'll develop one for you, or we will find someone that's already done. All right. I also see a question there, if I can jump in about, all right, as we thinking about maybe high holidays, what type of training should we consider? Obviously, we can't do them all. Um, uh, definitely we'll pass to Bill and Ilya for their intake. I think 
a, a, sta a situational awareness training for all congregants could be worthwhile. Um, I think ushers and volunteers should get a more in-depth type training. There's going to be a lot of non-regulars on location. You know, you might be using a different part of your building that people aren't as familiar with the exits. Um, so something that they can ensure that they can spread the mes message and, and lead people in an emergency situation. Bill, you want to add on that? Uh, recommended trainings before high holidays, if you can only do a few. Yeah, good point. Um, um, and also, since you're going to have, um, you know, the high holidays, you may not have your regulars there, people that are only there every so often. Um, make sure that you're reinforcing, uh, again, the fundamentals. Where are the emergency exits? Uh, what are our, you know, evacuation routes out of the building? How will we respond if a fire alarm rings, if there's an attack and those sorts of things? And that's going to that's going to be driven on, on local procedures or driven by local procedures. So, um, I've seen congregations doing that diff diff in different ways. Um, you know, the seatback card, like we may, like we've shown in other seminars or announcements before services begin, before we start. Remember, like I use the, uh, the aviation industry a lot. Remember, before we take off, we're going to find our exits. Remember, your nearest exit may be behind you. Same thing in the, in the sanctuary or in a social hall. You make sure you, you identify those things up front. Sorry, Dave. Go ahead. No, I, I, we, we have a library which will uh, send out uh in august so uh people know what uh what we're recommending and and uh we will uh, you know hopefully the, these high holidays will be the first time we're really back and it'll be a tremendous uh response god willing uh but uh you know what we will be out front and get you information thank you david while we have you uh those of you who, who've uh Known me, know I've been working with David for a long, long time and can steal half of his uh, stories and analogies. But there's one doing a training session we can't miss about some of our Yankees friends that I think will bring home the message on some of our uh, the messages we've been sending here. I'll leave that to David, though. Well, well, you know, it, it, it's the um, the one I, I used to use uh, Derek Jeter, but I don't. You know, people don't necessarily know. Uh, who Derek Jeter is anymore, They're, you know, uh, we're getting old. Uh, but let's say Aaron Judge, since he's in the news every day this week. Uh, Aaron Judge goes out every day and shags fly balls. It's not as if he uh, hasn't been doing that since he was in Little League, at five year, junior Little League at five years old. But he still goes out. And the most important thing with training is we're converting what we know intellectually into muscle memory. Because when you, when it comes to an emergency, goes back to Bill's lizard brain. We want to know what's in the lizard brain. And if the lizard brain tells us how to act and it's the right thing, then it'll be the right thing. Uh, and the, the average person loses 20 IQ points in an emergency. So... You know, you want to go and make your plans and Im implant those plans in your lizard brain as much as possible. You know, an another thing in terms of drills, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, doing, uh, you know, Ilya's slide about everyone asleep uh, at the training is terrific. But, uh, you know, our office building and many schools have to do uh, a certain number of um, fire drills. And, you know, people, you know, the first reaction is grumbling. Why are they making us do this? Then people kind of walk out, do, you know. And I used to yell at someone saying, hi, this is a fire drill. Aren't, why don't we um, grab the hard drives out of the server? Because if this is a real fire, if we have the hard drives, then we can get back into business immediately, just buy a piece of hardware and everything is configured accurately. You know, now everything's in the cloud, but you know, back then, you know, what should be in your fire drill, just a plain vanilla fire and getting back to the, um, uh, the uh, uh, high holidays, we had an instance about 10 years ago on Long Island where they had a plain vanilla fire, people smelled smoke, 
and they literally trampled someone in a wheelchair trying to evacuate because there wasn't an evacuation plan. And people didn't get good instructions. And, you know, that's another thing that you do in exercises and drills. Uh, you know, when you have, when the rabbi has a set of set instructions on the bima with him, and he knows what to read, he doesn't have to make it up. And you tell people exactly how to act. You know, how are you going to train your ushers? Because they're going to be your leaders. You don't want everyone using the same door. You know, I, I made a uh, big mistake once. I was working with the school on fire drills and I wanted to teach that they shouldn't all go out the same door. So being the creative uh, person that I am, I got some dry ice and I, uh, just before the, uh, the fire drill, I smoked up the lobby. And kids came down the stairs and screamed. Well, I, I did teach them that they, they have to think about alternatives, but that was a little too far. Now what I do is I recommend, you know, you have the kids draw up a couple of flames and have kids standing there, standing with um, poster board flames. You can't go here, you know, so that people know that they have to use alternative doors. You know, Training should anticipate different options because life always changes. And if you plan for the worst, you probably, you know, the plain vanilla ones, you can probably handle pretty well. Gotcha. Thank you, David. Glad, uh, glad we pulled you up onto the front screen here. I didn't want to steal all, all, the, uh, all your thunder. Uh, very important points. Um, on that note, Bill, are there any more questions we haven't got to yet? Um, I see some points people are adding to the chat. So thank you, everybody. Some good, some good information. If not. Yeah, if you could just uh, repeat our future plans. I know you mentioned it already. Uh, we're going to be on hiatus until, uh, until when again? I don't know if there's a, a firm answer yet. We definitely need to get through the NSGP period, um, upcoming holidays, um, but definitely stay uh, signed up to get the emails from this. Stay in touch with your RSM. Uh, no hard date yet, um, as far as I know. And, and you know, we're, we're going to be giving, the, you know, uh, transitioning into grant mode. Uh, our current guess is that the applications will be out May 1st, plus or minus a week. And uh, I, I think that's going to... Uh, uh, it's going, the maximum will likely be, everything is still up in the air until we see it in writing, likely to be $200,000 uh, up from $150,000. Um, you know, so we can really take care of those doors that we're, we've been worried about, um, you know, and, and things like that. Um, the grant will be simplified. There's a... Um, Maybe a glitch on a, uh, on the Duns number. Uh, stay tuned. Keep. Uh, we're going to probably send something out like that. Uh, uh, something out uh, because uh, you might have to get a new number. But uh, uh, you know, we're we're trying to figure everything out, and as soon as we get information, we get it out to the field. Thank you, David. I think with that. As, as usual, we're a little over 11, our 11, but as Ilya pointed, we want to make sure we're always here to make it interactive, take your questions. If we missed a few, your RSM, all of us are still available to reach out to. Uh, before we close out, um, I definitely want to say a huge thank you and make sure everyone's aware of the work Seth Goodstein does behind the scenes to make these pretty flawless, in my opinion, makes my life easier. So thank you, Seth. Much appreciated. Uh, looking forward to us getting back on the horse with these. Um, thank you to the whole CSI team. You know, they usually uh, on board, taking the questions, adding adding their uh, insight and uh, information to to share with everybody here. Um, so, and I'll I'll just say, looking forward to when we get these back up and going. Thank you to the whole team. And I'll turn it to Ilya and then maybe David to uh, close out. 
Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, always a pleasure to engage with everyone. And uh, I know that you'll, you'll be engaged with the uh, CSI team. Uh, we'll uh, stay tuned for more announcements for upcoming training. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Mitch. Thank you to the team. Have a happy Passover. Happy Pesach. Thank you, Bill and Seth. Ilya, it's been a pleasure. Holiday. See you guys in a little bit. Same here. Happy holidays. Take care.